Hey everyone, welcome to Martaloop Church, to our snazzy, makeshift, ever-evolving room in the back corner of the basement, the church basement recording studio. It is slowly getting there, so sorry if uh, you're picking up weird reflections or the sound has changed. Uh, we, are, uh, we are scrambling, it seems, to uh, be able to do church online as best we can. Um, yeah, to start, I just want to say that I hope uh, you're all doing well. Uh, I know in our family, just uh, continued uh, stress and additional work uh, in doing life in the context of this pandemic. And I hope that uh, God is touching your life in uh, very real and tangible ways in this time where, yeah, we just aren't touched and can't touch as much. I call my parents uh, once a week just to see how they're doing in their seniors home in Ontario a subtle promotion for commandment number five coming up in the next series um, and it's such a struggle for them to uh, be cooped up completely in their building um, such big restrictions in the part of Toronto where they live and disconnected and untouched um, you could just feel their angst so many grandchildren <laughs> and so few hugs so may God touch you Today, if you're a grandparent or a parent or somebody uh, other than that who just misses um, the touch of another human being. And may God bless you today and touch you today through the church words uh, in a sermon or a prayer or a reading that are going to be spoken or through the song that Dan's going to be singing. May, may that touch of God, uh, hopefully prayerfully through those things, um, evoke a real and powerful sense of his presence in your life. Okay, today we continue our series, the first uh, chunk of our series on the Ten Commandments, with a look at the third commandment, which is, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. And my hope in this message is to answer two questions. What does it mean to misuse God's name? That would be good to know. <laughs> and then positivizing it, as we're trying to do with all these commands. Um, what does it mean to rightly use God's name? And as you just heard in the commandment, um, to misuse God's name uh, is a problem for God. It is to engage in a guilt-worthy offense. But when we use God's name rightly, the opposite, of course, is true. Uh, when we use God's name rightly, it is a praiseworthy offense, a praiseworthy act. An act through which and in the midst of which we can find life and find it in abundance. So before we dive into all of that, um, let's begin, as we have for each of these Ten Commandment um, services, with a reading of the Ten Commandments. And if you're thinking, again, uh, hey, I grew up in a church where we read them every single Sunday, um, sometimes twice on a Sunday. Anyway, they're still good. Uh, no caveats required. This, these are the Ten Commandments. And God spoke all these words. I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image, an idol, in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments." You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor 
your father and your mother, so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, and you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's spouse or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Please uh, join me in a prayer. <clears throat> uh, God, as we seek to understand this commandment um, about not taking your name in vain, um, misusing your name, um, we pray that even as we're hearing words and engaging thoughts and ideas and song, that you'd speak your name, uh, that your name and character and being would uh, uh, become clear to us and present to us in a way that enables us to hear your commandment uh, with a fuller and deeper understanding, a more efficacious and transformative understanding. So meet us uh, through a move and a blowing and a whispering of your Holy Spirit in this way, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, uh, do you remember how it felt um, the first time or maybe the most numinous time you experienced someone forgetting your name? You know, it might have been one of those times, it often is, right, where it isn't the worst thing in the world because you've only met this person once and they're the kind of person who meets so many people in so many ways and so you really weren't expecting to be remembered and so you graciously drop your name into the conversation uh, and you move on. But if, if someone should have known your name and forgot your name, well then it is a little bit different, right? It kind of stings a little bit more. I mean, really? Uh, I thought you knew me. And if you've been forgotten in bigger ways than just merely your name, um, maybe bigger and more painful ways, um, then maybe you know what it feels like at that level. Maybe you've uh, sat in a class full of students and were the unseen forgotten name for weeks or months or a whole semester. Or maybe you've been part of a group at work where your contribution and all that you were in terms of committing to that job and that team, um, that it was passed over, passed over for promotion, not noticed, not been given the next opportunity or picked for the next team. I mean, you wonder, does anyone even know I'm here? Or, or maybe you've even been more deeply hurt uh, when you've been forgotten by as a person by someone who uh, used to be very close to you, who uh, maybe suddenly got way too busy uh, to remember you and remember your name and uh, pay attention to you, like maybe your dad or your mom or a close friend, um, or even maybe more heavy, uh, as heavy as that. Uh, someone suddenly stopped loving you in a committed relationship, uh, maybe your ex-partner or a spouse, or, or a sibling, who, in all of these cases, someone who forgot you. I mean, it's, it's the worst, isn't it? Being forgotten. And really, it's not much better if you're the one doing the forgetting, to, to be saddled with the guilt, <laughs> acknowledged or not, of having turned away from somebody, or forgotten somebody, or not remembering who they were, that's not a great thing either. Um, and I get it. While it's true that nobody, uh, me first on the list, can remember everybody's name and everybody's story and everybody's life and attend to them fully um, or be all things to all people all the time, there are some things in life that we simply should never forget, like God's name, which we do forget. Um, every time we break the third commandment, we forget. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. When I was a kid sitting in church hearing the Ten Commandments read every week, they read it from an oldie English version, the King James Version, um, and 
it was translated with these words. So they always come to mind uh, when I think about the third commandment. Um, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Often I hear those words in the voice of my mother. Um, so when I was young, I, <laughs> I thought that that simply meant um, not swearing, um, not using callous, flippant, or blasphemous language, um, using the literal moniker or name of God. Uh, and of course, that's still a very good and practical uh, interpretation of the commandment. Um, I still cringe every time I hear someone say Jesus in the context when they don't really mean Jesus. I mean, Jesus is so much more than an exclamatory noun. His name means so much more than any of us could ever imagine. Okay, so to really understand this command, um, the King James version of it that I just uh, spoke, um, we need to unpack a couple of, of the words in that commandment. Um, when, when the third commandment uses the word name, and I've said this before in church, it's not just referring to the moniker, a one-word title um, that is that person um, that we give God. A, a person's name in the Bible is more expansive than, than that. In the ancient context, a name expressed a person's character and being and essence. A name was who they were in, in a much deeper sense. And when this commandment uses the uh, word uh, in the Old English version again, uh, the phrase in vain, you need to know that in the original Hebrew, um, the, the word for in vain means for unreality or as empty. So, to not take God's name in vain is to not take God's character as unreality, to not treat God's being as empty. So it's as though God is saying through this command, don't take me for granted and don't live as though I'm not here. Or more positively, Understand who I am and what I do. Know that I am more real than you can ever imagine. See me, hear me, touch me, and know me in all of my fullness. D don't, don't ever forget my name. So several years ago, whenever I think of this commandment, this event, life event comes up, several years ago, or was it even years ago? I, I can't recall because my father still brings it up every other month. Um, several years ago, I forgot to pick my dad up at the airport here in Calgary. Uh, he was coming to visit for a couple of days, um, and the occasion was I was being officially ordained into the ministry. I'd already been pastoring for 10 years, but I was getting officially uh, going through my ordination. So he, you know, he made the trip from Ontario out to uh, participate in that event. And for some reason, I got my days mixed up, and uh, I uh, forgot to pick him up at the airport. So after trying to unsuccessfully call us from the airport, uh, he had to take a cab to our house and then sit on our front stair uh, for three hours until someone finally came home. So yeah, he keeps bringing it up. Um, so at first, of course, I apologized profusely, and, uh, and then, you know, the next day as he brought it up, I thought, okay, Dad, you can get over it now. Um, I wanted to get over my guilt, uh, so you can get over it now, Dad, but he couldn't. And uh, even though he continually would bring it up in a joking fashion, um, like we do, <laughs> he continued to bring it up in the ensuing days and then weeks and then months and even years later it comes up. And it was only uh, much later that I realized that uh, I really did hurt my dad a, a lot more than I was willing to acknowledge. And maybe that's why he kind of held on to it because he never heard a fulsome apology. I mean, he chose to come to his son's ordination and, you know, bought the ticket and caught the early, early flight that day and then sat on a plane from Toronto to Calgary for four hours, I'm sure, thinking about seeing his family. And he felt the feeling of feeling excited uh, when the plane, plane was landing and then coming down the escalator and then walking through the gate and then no, no one, no running grandkids, no hugs or kisses from Edward, no 
catching up conversation on the drive back to the house, no answers to his desperate phone calls, no open door, no one. In, in what should have been a big and good welcoming moment, he was totally forgotten and abandoned. I mean, can you imagine forgetting your own father? You forgot the God who gave you birth. They forgot what he had done, the wonders he had shown them. They forgot the God who saved them. My people have forgotten me, God says, days without number. And we forget God. <laughs> We, we forget that God is here and always here and totally here and completely here. We fail to recognize God's presence, to acknowledge who God really is in God's presence and to give the credit due to God's name because God is God. And, and we somehow get to a place in our lives where we live as though we can't see him or won't or don't see him or hear him or sense him or love him near enough. Not as per original design specs, that's for sure. And in our most broken and, you know, theological speak, sinful, unawake, asleep moments before God, we, as Paul writes, we, we never give God the time of day. And so God reminds us, don't take my name in vain. I won't hold you guiltless if you take my name in vain, if you misuse my name. So thinking about how my dad felt in being forgotten, um, it made me wonder how God, my father, our father, feels in being forgotten. If my people would only listen to me, if, if they would only follow my ways, what I wouldn't give if they'd always feel this way, continuing to revere me and always keep my commands, They'd have a good life forever, they and their children. And yet, they wandered over mountain and hill and, and forgot their own resting place. And again, yeah, you read that and it feels so ironic that we would break this commandment. We wander over mountain and hill looking for meaning in life and in so doing forget the only name, the only God that can bring us meaning in life. And, and the real sad part is that when we forget God's name, uh, that's the moment that we begin to forget our own names, uh, who we are, our God-like character, being, and essence, what we're meant for, uh, a fullness of life that images and reflects his fullness of life, why we're here to say, and honor, to, to say the name of and honor and glorify God's name. But when we remember God's name, when we know who God is and live our lives in a way that responds to God accordingly, then we begin to know our names in their fullness, know our names again, and maybe for the very first time again. Our, our one day, um, eternal, uh, real and present here and now names. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give that person a white stone, God says, with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. I mean, how, how beautiful. Just for you. That uniquely just for you, that name. I, I will give them an everlasting name that will not be cut off or forgotten or left behind, or ignored. Do not be afraid, for I've ransomed you. I've called you by name. You are mine. You are his. You belong to God. God knows your name. And God is, is your God uh, when you know God's name. God is your God, I guess, when we don't know God's name, but you can know that God is your God when you know God's name. 
And you know, the Bible uh, talks uh, in many different places about the, the name, the character, the being, the essence of God, with sometimes very specific words uh, that bring out different uh, aspects of, of the name of God. Um, and we can't unpack all of those, but a few of those. When you, when you know the, the, the God who saves, the God who is the saving and forgiving part of God's name, his character and being, um, after he's maybe reached down into your life and touched your eyes so that you could see his face and recognize his godness again, and, and then you, out of that experience, out of that gaze, your life is transformed, and you then start to live into your new name as a person um, imbued with um, saving power and forgiveness. You know, what, what God did in his name for you becomes part of your name and your name toward others, and soon your actions start to reflect God's saving love, and you become more and more you, like I felt this week, standing on 51st Street, bumping into my neighbor from two doors up, ask him how things are going. I'd been thinking about him, and we'd been praying for our neighbors, uh, them in particular, for weeks, and I, th I thought we were praying for their jobs or their economic. Well, no, he says, well, you should know. We just split up after nine years. I'm trying to find an apartment, buy a new car. Like he was lost. And I got to, by the grace of God and God's providential walking uh, timing, um, to express so much of God's encouragement and love. And you're not alone in this, Thomas. Um, uh, the power of God present and playing out on 51st Street on, on, on Tuesday night. Or when you know the holy part of God's name, uh, God's perfection and infinite and eternal otherness, his glory. After God has maybe pulled back the curtain and given you just a glimpse of his majesty so that you can know just a bit more about the godness of God, if you've had one of those moments, and if you've had one of those moments, you know, that place where you're totally humbled and, and you just kind of realize you're just a, just, you're, you're a creature, you're the maid, he's the maker, you're a creature bef before your creator, and, and then in that trembling, humbling place, you begin to feel God's reaching out to you and and you know in your kind of oh my goodness i'm i'm just a creature god kind of touches you touches your mouth like he did with isaiah and says behold this has touched your lips your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for and then out of that newly atoned place before the holiness of god somehow you know you're not just a mere creature anymore you're a child of god and then you hear him again speak your name. Or maybe you come to understand the name of God in terms of the calling part of God's name. That, that God is a God who calls people unto himself and then calls them into a life of response. When you hear his voice through Christ, echoing and saying, this is my child, you are my child, in whom I am well pleased. When you hear Jesus say, follow me, and then you, you do, and you follow him like how you try to follow him, like how he followed the Father. And then you end up stepping onto new paths that lead to a new life that you could have never imagined for yourself. That's not just for the apostles and the saints in the Bible. I mean, you saw how, you've read maybe how corrupt and broken and fallible and human and frail they all were. It's as much for you as them to be moving in the power of God, God's calling power and the fullness of your name. And then maybe going out and being called to help others know their names. And when you step into this called and empowered life, you'll know <laughs> your name. You'll know this is why God has put me here. I felt that on Tuesday night talking with Thomas. I'm, this is why I'm here. This is why you made me. This one thing is, a, is an echo of so many times where I've been able to, be, to represent your name and to speak your name and to live out of my name, born out of your name to the world. It's my purpose in life, and it's your purpose in life. Maybe not in the ministry, but wherever God has placed you. 
I mean, that is what your real name is. All because he put his name in you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. So, this commandment, right? Don't take God's name in vain. Do the opposite. Strive to know it more. Listen for it. Listen for the whispers of the Spirit. Read the scriptures and listen for God's voice. Um, and, and, and hearing the voice, be reminded of the name, the nature, the essence, the being of God. Know who God really is um, for God's glory. And then out of that glory, uh, know again uh, who you really are, what, what your name is. Okay, for my closing prayer, a little bit different this week, I'm going to read a prayer from the Apostle Paul. It's just a powerful and eloquent plea uh, to God um, uh, for his spirit to help us to really know God's name, uh, to know who God is um, in, a, yeah, in a more kind of way, in a real, deep, uh, deeply transformative, life-changing, changing wisdom imbuing way. So I'm going to read this prayer, and you can read it along with me on the screen or just close your eyes and hear it as a prayer that way. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he's called you the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is evoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things, including you, under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church and the cosmos, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Amen. How great this love No, oh, it's moving on my mountains This perfect love It's casting out my fears How great this love no one welcomes me like family And anywhere I go It meets me there And he is good And he is God and what I've earned It's not what I've got And he is just Oh, so kind What I deserve It's not what I find What more could I say about it My God is love Now grave this love No one's faithful through my failures This trust in love with me till the end Now great this love No oh, it's closer than a brother oh, When this is love He died so I could live and He is good oh, And He is God What I've earned It's not what I 
what other way could we use his name when we know what God's name means, who God is, what Christ has done, and the magnitude of his love? Church, would you go forth today, go out into the world, and know who God is, the greatness of his love, the sacrifice of Christ? Church, go forth and sin no more. Have a great week, and God bless. Thank you.